Hey, welcome back to my little garage full of machines. Hey, I got the rest of the story of the hydraulics and where uh, I got into uh, making three jaw chucks run as true as possible to tackle hydraulics situation that uh, that cropped up and I'll tell you how that cropped up you might find it interesting well back in the 1980s uh, early 1980s the EPA was pretty active on a lot of fronts and uh, one of them was out, out in the forest um, on the uh, public lands where uh, had contractors and operators that were um, bidding on timber sales and then uh, logging the properties and uh, leaving pollution behind. And so what they come up with, in, and a lot of uh, operators uh, back then, it's like the early 1980s, some of the equipment was from the 1950s and 60s, you know, some of it was really old. And you take industrial equipment like logging, stuff like that, and hydraulics in general, they just make great strides every decade. And uh, containing hydraulic fluid. So you take equipment that's already 30 or 40 years old and it used packing to uh, and sealing uh, materials that were basically used on steam engines, you know, still. So the stuff would sweat and drip oil. So, and it would get worse with the wear and over time. And uh, in modern industry in the 80s and stuff, of course, you know, hy uh, hydraulics was uh, quite a bit more advanced where they had good seals and um, rod wipers and things like that, just a lot better stuff. You know, the manufacturers like Caterpillar and others. So what the Forest Service, um, and uh, the D, uh, Department of Natural Resources did was force these contractors to park their equipment on, on cardboard that they had prepared. They had to leave the equipment for a certain amount of time. And then they would look at the drips in, in, in the cardboard and decide whether or not to condemn that piece of equipment. So what we could do as a machine shop was install modern seals into old equipment basically was what it was and control that oil and then they could get that piece of equipment back uh, out in the field hopefully at a reasonable cost that they could afford and of course some equipment was just so worn out it should have been <laughs> gotten rid of a lot before. So. The faster you could uh, replace those seals and modify those parts that took that old packing and, and seals, uh, the more you could make. So it became uh, pretty important to have a three-jaw chuck because most of the stuff was round and uh, you had to make new parts, uh, re partially re replace stuff, fully replace stuff, uh, fabricate uh, cylinders from uh, from scratch and all that stuff's available, even pre-honed uh, tubing and uh, all the seals and pistons and rods and all that stuff's all, all available. Well, another truck that uh, was, was very important, it's very important to me, is a, a truck that holds things better than a, than a scroll truck, holds things really tight. And that's always, uh, with me, probably going to be a four-jaw chuck. But a four-jaw chuck that's set up a little bit better, and I, and I have one here, and I'll, I'll get the camera wrapped around. I'll be right back. All right, this is the most solid, most accurate, and also economical chuck I could come up with. Uh, a lot of bang for the buck. For this 14-inch um, axle son, it's a 6-inch four-jaw, but it, it's, it's a heavy-duty one. It's um, what they refer to as a solid chuck. I'm going to hang on to it so this thing doesn't flop off that board. And uh, 
the the body is solid it's not cored out or or hollow like uh, many of them <clears throat> And on the spindle here, I have the first uh, smaller chuck that I adapted to this gear head lathe is a six inch buck six jaw, which is really a good chuck. It's uh, really great for tubing and thin wall stuff, bushings and, and uh, other things. Uh, it, it tends not to leave marks on on work, which is pretty nice for things, and, it, and that's an adjust true. But the problem with scroll chucks, it's like a three jaw, but it's got three more cuts in it for three more jaws, making it a little less uh, stable. Is there's quite a bit of deflection from tool pushover because uh, it, it's just a weaker body. Uh, being hollow with the scroll in it. <clears throat> Got some pollen in the air that's making me hoarse here. So back here to this four jaw, this thing's probably uh, 50 or 60 years old. I found it dirt cheap on eBay. It uh, had not been used. Uh, it's just been kicked around and it got some stains and some corrosion on it and uh, Got this thing for hundred and twenty five dollars, which is a good price now I was looking at some bison chucks and of course new chucks are really quite expensive, but uh, um, there, There's a few used in good shape bison chucks kicking around, but they're another hundred bucks or so but uh, I know these old chucks, like this one here, is a Union. It's got the um, solid body, heavy jaws with the big screws. <laughs> this this, uh, this chuck's really solid, but it, it holds work with less deflection. And it's like deflection, the uh, tool is pushing the work over, and it causes if the if the work's not supported on the end here, uh, it causes the work to be bigger on the end. And uh, of all the chucks I got, I'm getting the best out of the out of this one in stock up to uh, two inch. And uh, this this one here is the worst for that <laughs> for that. So, okay, I got another thing to look at, but this is uh, the final chuck here. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm set up really good for chucks. I uh, fabricated this uh, back plate for it as thin as I possibly could. You can see the, the tap drill holes for the, uh, for the front screws actually go into the locating taper. But it, it really doesn't matter. I think you can see that okay right there. The screw stops right there. So it still locates uh, fine on the taper. It's just that I snug things up. Uh, about the thinnest plate I could come up with so far is about an uh, inch and a quarter thick. Okay. So that, that's uh, the chuck situation for there. The, the next step up is I've got a uh, Union 8 inch. That, that's a real good chuck like this. But for like two, what I'm finding is like two inches in smaller uh, materials, I'm getting the best uh, accuracy out of that one. Okay, let's go have a look at something real exotic. Okay, here's a unique and rare uh, machine tool attachment of a viewer sent from England. And uh, the attachment here is a wall hopter made in Germany. And from what I found, they made them from 1948 to 1968. And it's one of the most complicated uh, milling attachments, I think, that um, has ever been invented. 
And it's kind of funny. He just uh, says, well, heck, I'll send this to you. And I go, okay. And, uh, and he sends it. Then it kind of gets held up in the mail. It was like... Uh, he was at a place called Donington Castle for days. Who knows what they did? They uh, they got into it though. They got into the box. Then it, it shows up here and, and looked at the center part. The, what do you call that? Uh, computer reader parts all torn up. Then it has a thing at the bottom here. UPS access point item. I've never heard of a UPS access point item until I got this. <laughs> For some, some reason, they didn't want to give it to me uh, directly. But since this was all messed up here, they're planning on sending it back to England to this, this fellow uh, Jan. And uh, so anyway, uh, it made it here. And uh, I think some officials uh, had to look up on Google to try to figure out what this thing was and <laughs> kept pulling it out. Who knows? But uh, once it got here in the States, it, it got here pretty quick. Okay, well, we'll get back to this other stuff here. Let's see if I got that thing in the frame there. It looks like it's in the frame. Okay, what this is, it's a wall hopter angle cutting head. Let's see if we can find the number on it. It <laughs> I get so many reflections. This wall hopter stuff's pretty uh, fancy. It's a UK four slash two zero one, and I've I've heard about these. I've known about these, and this is one of the most exotic heads you can put on a, on a melon machine of course made by wall hopter that's famous for uh boring and facing heads and i have a a good example here and i'll be getting that out and also i have the tree angle cutting head and I think it'll be fun to get uh, do a comparison between this one and that one. Now, the, this one operates completely different than any other one on the planet. And part of it is this block here. I could push it in and uh, you can see it operate. Well, it's got uh, like a set of ways here, dovetail ways. And so half the block travels horizontally, but the entire thing travels vertically on this stationary piece here that has the dovetail on it. Let's see if I can push it back. On this piece here, it's going up and down. So instead of uh, <clears throat> setting this thing for an angle normally, it's got an angle setting here, but it doesn't tilt this block at all. And what it does is it proportions the feed at whatever angle you set for the... Uh, horizontal and the vertical uh, feed. So um, if you set the thing at 90 degrees and put indicators on it and you, you can, this is the mechanism that feeds it from the top here. So if you set it at 90 degrees and um, it, it will read the same going down as it is going out this way to cut that angle. So it's doing it with the feed instead of uh, 
you said the, the angle and I've read read in some literature for these I've read up on them and there's some stuff to find on the internet regarding these and uh, one, of, one of the funniest uh, of them all is uh, they made these between 1948 and 1968. Maybe they made 200 of them and they were in wooden boxes with attachments like the, like the Morin heads. Uh, I don't know if there's any instructions, but it, they're just quirky. If you're, if you're used to the boring head, you're used to the little engagement buttons and little dials and stuff that this has here. So I, it's going to take a few videos to get this thing uh, working. Right now I'm working oil through it so it's working real smoothly and not kicking out a clutch in uh, mid-shift. And there's just a lot of little things you have to overcome. Of course, nothing's really labeled too much. A little bit here, you got the angle dial and it talks uh, stroke settings. And uh, here's a, a place you can use a rod you can fix to a table or something to hold that. But normally, you would hold this with your hand. And then, if you engage this one, I think I have to engage this one first, but it's kind of, it, it's tough with my fingers. Um, that's when you uh, engage uh, the feeds, to feed this thing. Okay, I thought I would uh, show you this. <laughs> one of the things that uh, uh, Wallhopter had to say about it, well, they're not being used anymore because the craftsmen that knew how to use it are, have passed away. <laughs> <laughs> these uh, still show up every every now and then and uh, a lot of times they're with uh, jig boring machines like uh, uh, SIP and uh, Dixie but uh, it'll be fun to uh, it, it looks like it's going to function fine and uh, just get the thing slicked up and I'll, I'll do some videos on that well I got a lot coming up and uh, uh, it's been awful hot in here, so I've been taking a little bit of time off, but uh, the weather's kind of cooperating. I'm back in here, and I hope uh, things are going good in your shop. I'll be back soon here, and uh, thanks for tuning in tonight.